So I was trained as a Bantuist, but I started to, for my PhD to work on the Cushitic language. And, and over the years, I've, I've done a number of things in the area of the contact between the two language groups. And um, so the presentation today is uh, not all of it, but most of it put together, and I will skip here and there, because even though I have an hour, I have too many slides. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been thinking about what kind of things I want to, to, to put to the table today. So um, language contact, and I'll be talking about contact-induced change, that is the change in the norms of the language. And also I want, will talk about social linguistic situations of languages in contact and the impact that has on the language use, language behavior. Uh, often distinction is not made between the, these two dimensions and I think sometimes I will make the distinction to, to keep us uh, sharp on um, what we can deduce from the outcomes of uh, language contact. And a recurrent theme will also be the complexity. Towards the end of the talk, I'll talk about uh, data that we collected from a more, no, a dead Cushitic language, Asa, and, and the, the challenges that you have when you collect data like this and the, uh, what we should learn from that, from the data that we are using from other uh, languages that were recorded in similar circumstances. Um, when, when we are doing language contact, we do depend on, on, on the standard linguistic reconstruction. And in the area of, uh, of East Africa, where Bantu and Cushitic meet, um, we, we, we could have better level of reconstruction in uh, both the, the Cushitic and the and the uh, Bantu side, but also for Nilotic, which is a major player in the field as well. Um, I hope I will get, a, I'm trying to get a project to, to go deeper into the linguistic history of East Africa, and that will include to expand primarily the, the reconstruction of Cushitic. Um, So in the, uh, when we talk about contact, what is also the complexity is that there, there will be uh, layers and layers of contact of the same language groups. And, and that is uh, challenging to, to disentangle and yet crucial if we want to know more about history of East Africa because, yeah, linking to, to archaeology, for example, what I think would be promising is to, to try to to reconstruct in the way contact situations and to s try to see if that could be linked up with the contact that the archaeologists see in the area. Uh, um, uh, I say I would uh, put forward that historical linguistics is in the end a historical science that has some consequences for uh, the kind of argumentation that you build up. So we are building stories that is what history is, on the basis of evidence. But uh, that also means that although part of it, um, the historical linguistics, the comparative method, is very uh, deductive and therefore predictive, a lot of it, and certainly in the area of language contact, is not predictive. And in that sense, uh, Occam's razor, that is the most simplest explanation, is can be putting us on the wrong track. So I'm very wary of using that argument. Um, uh, I don't have to spend much time on, on this. You people here in the room know about Bantu, so they know that it's very agglutinative, a lot of suffixing, derivation for vacancy, noun classifiers, and uh, both of the language groups have the same rough characteristics. Um, both I had an initial in the noun phrase, which is a little bit surprising for the Cushitic as far as it is concerned in East Africa, but it is uh, an initial. Um, of course, a different lexicon in the sounds in the word order. Uh, they are in contact, we know 
that are in contact with Kenya, Tanzania, very his long history of contact. There are no a priori expectations of difference in power. I mean, at the moment, yes, Swahili is dominant in, in East Africa. There uh, can be no doubt about that. But during the centuries, um, it is not the, clearly the case that if it's true that the Bantu came later than the Cushitic people, then then we can't assume that the Bantu must have been uh, in, in, in a, a stronger political power than the Cushitic people, nor the other way around. So we have a lot of different uh, situations for the Cushitic languages because you have cattle and, and camel nomads in, in East Africa that are Cushitic, that use a Cushitic language. You have all these small uh, Rogo groups or hunter-gatherers or, or former hunter-gatherers, Sanya, well, the whole list is there. Uh, there are more uh, that nowadays uh, speak or uh, uh, remember a Cushitic language, and the vast majority, but the four of uh, Tanzania, Iraq, Gorwa, Alakwa, Burungi, primarily agriculturist with cattle as an important factor in their, in their culture. Um, my, my first topic is... Uh, what happens nowadays, um, what we see is, of course, a lot of loan words. Um, the two systems of Cushitic and, and, and Bantu are very similar and different. So they're both classified. The Cushitic language have a gender system. The Bantu languages have a gender system of their own, the, the, the noun class system. So I want to go briefly into what happens when Cushitic uh, languages borrow from Swahili. They have to put those nouns into the gender system. So they have both two challenges, adaptation to gender, but also adaptation to the uh, number. And in number, Cushitic uh, languages are uh, uh, yeah, a bit special in the sense that they have uh, singulative forms, plurative forms, they have, uh, it's often described as a general system with general number that, that can be used for any number situation and then in the derived rule. I think it's a little bit more uh, complex than that, but um, um, so when a Cushitic language like Iraku will borrow from Swahili, it has to decide, do we do we borrow it as a singular noun or do we borrow it as a plural noun? Uh, whereas for most languages in the world that wouldn't be an issue, you would borrow it as a singular noun and derive the plural uh, inflectionally. I think I will skip this in a way and say, well, a lot of, a lot of things happen. Uh, what, is, what is recurrent? is uh, Swahili and Rendile and other languages that people are taken, uh, the plural form is taken from Swahili and that is taken as general number and then the singulars are derived. Um, uh, then uh, sometimes the plural form of other, of other words are taken as a general word or as a plural word. Um, I have a number of, of items here for which you can imagine. Yes, it doesn't surprise me that we take that as a, a plural, both in the source and in, in Iraku. Uh, but for some of them, it's a little bit more difficult to imagine, but that is what happens. They take the plural form as a general uh, form, but also use as a singular, and they derive again plural from that. But I think Maua, Swahili, we will often talk about Maua rather than one particular flower. And um, the Iraku then form a singular from a uh, plural from that. Musmari is uh, presumably taken fr from a singular form but used as a plural and the singular is derived, same for the onions. But the form with the ru, kitunguru, so can't be, can't be from Swahili, must have been another source. Mm. 
Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to skip a lot because I want to go, I want to reach the end. Which, uh, <laughs> I also want coffee at some point, and you too. Uh, as far as the gender is concerned, then uh, the, the gender system of, of Iraqu and it's a little bit for many other Christian languages is that you, you can't predict it, not from, certainly not from the semantics, you get very odd uh, relations between uh, gender and, and the semantics. Uh, can you predict it for the form? To some extent you can, because a lot of the, the suffixes, the num number suffixes, they do impose their gender on the word, so if you recognize a number suffix, you know which gender the word has. Uh, a little bit like in the, in the Swahili where the noun class prefix will tell you what gender it has to a large extent. Um, but, but then uh, uh, that doesn't, there's still uh, stand roots left with no suffix and there is some indication from uh, the, the final vowel like which gender it will be and that weak tendency is much stronger when you look at the long words so then the tendency becomes, becomes much clearer so those in who are predominantly masculine but often with a few examples are very much tend to be feminine if we look at rendile uh, it's also true that the final vowel will give you a fair indication of which gender the word will have but it's not the same kind of distribution. So uh, <coughs> here the, the O is uh, most of the is, is feminine, but the E, which, which would be feminine in, in Iraqu, they, they will be masculine in, in Rendile. So the, uh, the gender assignment is not the same, and that is a puzzle for the reconstruction of, of Kushitic. The first step, present day, was very brief because I want to get deeper. Uh, but first, a little bit more about um, borrowing and um, yeah, the multiple languages use in this in the situation. Um, I come to that because I, I worked uh, on the on borrowing in Iraq for this project in in Leipzig where they had. Uh, borrowability across languages, the same um, lexicon for a number of languages. We worked on that, uh, Marta Coro and I, and, and we would go through that set of words and think, well, what is the Iraqu word? And then Iraqu comes out to be fairly conservative. And um, sometimes I was surprised because, yes, uh, what is the situation for quite a number of, of normal items? You have an Iraqu word, uh, but you will hear the Swahili word quite often too. So in all those cases, we would take the Iraqu word, because there is an Iraqu word, but actually the, the number could have been quite different if we, we would have said, okay, we take both, and you can count both ways. But are those Swahili words part of the uh, Iraqu lexicon? And that is, of course, a very difficult question. When is a, a borrowing a borrowing, and when do we talk about code switching? So, uh, uh, the it is the case that in, in, these, in the language situation, people have the two languages at their disposal. They will use both. They will use both. Is there now rampant code switching in the Iraq area? difficult to know. I have, so I have this idea that, yes, I hear quite a, f quite a bit of code switching, um, but that is just my impression. And of course, all the, all the switches I will notice. I will, uh, my, my ears are uh, geared to that. Um, so I looked at um, uh, a documentary that was made in the Bulu area. It was 15 years of Dutch uh, uh, aid to the area and, and the Dutch parliament wanted to, to know is, was this of any use at all. So they sent a, a filmmaker to make a film about this. He went all through the Mbulu area, the district, and he was interviewing people. And they could speak whatever they wanted. Many of them spoke Iraq. Some of them, the officials would 
speak uh, Swahili and the expert would speak English. Uh, those language choices are interesting. But when you listen to all the Iraqi interviews, there are very few code switching there. There was a situation where it would be natural and normal to do that, but there's very little code switching. So I think I would be very interested in the future to, to get a lot more of casual conversation to get a better idea of what kind of code switching is, is going on. And, um, what kind of code switching? Because uh, Sara Petrolino, when she did a master thesis uh, on Iraqi Swahili code switching, she did it in Dar es Salaam uh, with people, I think, also partly linked to the university in the, on the kitchen table uh, recording conversations. Uh, very nice code switching data. And what was very interesting in those uh, in those data is the the very recurrent use of a light verb construction, uh, the verb ta to hit. Uh, it's an Iraqi verb, but I mean there is no light verb construction in Iraq, uh, but it is used in the code switching. Um, the, in, in code switching situations where people use the, uh, the strategy to use a light verb, ta is not, I mean, to, to hit is not used very often. But that part may not surprise us too much because there is then a transfer of, of Swahili habits, yeah, where the pika is a very often uh, used light verb. So this is the Swahili in their mind, but they, 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 they then make an Iraqi construction that doesn't exist with this light verb to introduce the, the Iraqi verbs. That way of, of uh, um, making insertions possible does not happen in the code switching that you hear in Bulu. Um, so I think we haven't looked enough in code switching as that there are different genres in, in, in the way you combine languages in depending on what kind of where you are, what, what kind of uh, situation it is. So there could be differences in strategies in code switching uh, uh, depending on that as well. Um, well, I'm, I'm bringing this all up because uh, yeah, uh, then Swahili is used in, uh, uh, in a, a in a context where you also use Iraq, but it is, it's, it's a complex thing for us linguists to put the boundaries of the language there and say, okay, now I'm going to count this as a, a, a borrowing, and I still, when I'm looking at these strategies, like how do we accommodate uh, Swahili words as a, as a singular and plural, I should just as much also look at the same strategies in, in the code suite. It doesn't really matter for that more uh, cognitive issue whether it's a, a word in the language or not. It is a word that is being used. So um, then um, we should just take data from all different uh, groups. When we look at the, at, the, at the loans, of course, these are the new concepts that are uh, Swahili borrowings. The discourse markers shouldn't surprise us. That happens a lot in code switching. Uh, effective terms, clause connectors, all those things that are very handy that right at the beginning of the clause you can give your attitude to what you're going to say. And uh, so when you can do that in another language, you will also do that in your own language. But then also, uh, in that same motivation of feeling the need and then using the word, I think is these uh, uh, intermediate uh, general level words, words like color, word, words like fish for all the fish, words like time, like news. Um, uh, you see quite a few of them are borrowed, not only from Swahili, but also from Datoga, an erotic language. And I think those words are also typically borrowed. It hasn't remarked often enough in the literature, I think, but immediate level terms are ones that when you know those in another language, you think, hey, this is handy. There's no need to have a word for color, but when you, uh, when you find out that that's possible to have a word for color, I will use that. 
Well, the last thing that is uh, um, current uh, language contact going on, Paka and Til. Well, I think all over Tanzania, Kenya, in every language we will use Paka for until. Nearly every. Maybe every. <laughs> what, those where I don't <laughs> find it, it is because people have been conservative in the, in, in the dictionaries. So I made a short study of uh, how the spread of Mpaka for until uh, through East Africa. Um, is this readable for. Uh, yeah? <clears throat> um, uh, but. Is this slide coming later? No. I just think you all know that. <laughs> <laughs> there is a word, let me <laughs> briefly say, anyway, there's this word Mpaka, the border, uh, in Swahili, and from that we have the word that is used as if it is a preposition. I don't think it is a preposition, but with the meaning until. Um, well, um, Mpaka is a Bantu word, so conceivably all the other Bantu language could do the same kind of grammaticalization. We could have either an issue of parallel grammaticalization, that in parallel, independently, all these languages, they will do the same kind of thing, use the word for border, for until. I will claim that that is not what is happening, for in the cases where I have, where I can distinguish that, it all is in the direction that they borrowed from Swahili, Baka, in a function of until. And they have still have a, a different word for the border. Well, they should have a different word for border in Ik, Borana, Konso, Sandawe, because those are all non Bantu languages. You are in contact with Bantu, so there I don't have that issue. Um, in a number of other languages that are non Bantu, we don't, we haven't. Borrowed the word until, but in Iraq we can use it too. What is D in Bantu? White? Yes, yes. Yeah. What is that? Oh, okay. Um, let me do the others and then maybe I will remember the last one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so until can be used for place and for time, um, and this means I have indication uh, that the word that is that paka is used for uh, place. Um, for Sandawe, I only have indication that it's used for time. This in itself is a strange distribution because I will I will claim later that this doesn't mean much. Most of the languages that use the word until will use it first of all for time, and they might also use it for place. Uh, in, in principle, we can have a, a, a introducing a noun phrase or the beginning of a noun phrase or the beginning of a clause. So both have in that is those yes. Uh, other, is there another word for until? Yes. And is it uh, different from Western D? I think it is. The word for boundary is different. That's what the D means. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there is a word for boundary that I found which is clearly different. And that that column will be more important for the Bantu languages that are on the next uh, mm -hmm. slide. Because here you see, for these. I can claim that the Mpaka form for until is borrowed because the word for boundary is, is markedly different, maybe related, different. For some of them, I, I, they're not maybe a bit different, but I cannot show that they are uh, not exactly. They, they, they could have the, the explanation that there's a parallel um, grammaticalization cannot be uh, discarded for these ones. So that is how the, but all of these languages you see, they work, they, they do use uh, a word for 
until that is uh, something like a paca. And for a bit more than half of them, it must have been borrowed from Swahili rather than taken from their own word for boundary. And here are a few more where you uh, also see that they are, uh, well, for many of them, they are different. There is some recurrent thing that I'm a little bit not sure about. Here you see that in part of the claim is that the word for the boundary has a syllabic M, but Haka for until does not. Um, what is it in Swahili? Uh, one of the most recent dictionaries in Swahili makes a difference in Swahili and say that the word for boundary has a syllabic M and the word for uh, until has then in the grammaticalization pro uh, process been reduced to a non-syllabic non uh, M. Whether that's true for Swahili, I'm, uh, I am not entirely sure. I mean, uh, when I, I checked with the, uh, some Swahili poets, and for the until, they would all still count three syllables. So I, I don't know who to trust, the dictionary makers or, or the poets. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, paka all over, and uh, in many cases from Swahili and not, not from internal development. It's so it hasn't spread. It, it is. It is strange, isn't it, in a way? Um, because it, it is borrowed as if it is a kind of preposition. Prepositions are not such a strong uh, word class in, in Swahili. Uh, I think it comes from a, a construction that is uh, also not so common in Swahili. Uh, uh, because the usual Swahili construction would be Mpaka wa Kenya, so with a, with a connector. Uh, and uh, you could argue maybe that the until construction comes from that and the wa is dropped. There is some slight indication uh, for that in the sense that in some novels you see in the Helsinki corpus, you see in Paka Wa in the meaning until, but it's very, very rare. And it is also in the kind of texts that are used in, uh, in sort of, uh, let me say, the, uh, the Dar es Salaam uh, prescriptive uh, Swahili. Um, but I think the construction comes from Paka plus the noun in the not in the meaning of the boundary of the, of, the, of the noun, but in the boundary is the noun. Because that is a much better semantic example to go uh, to, the act, to, the, to the meaning that the paka means until. So, um, and that construction uh, um, is less common in Swahili. And so in that sense, it's also strange. And it's uncommon in most of the languages in East Africa, but then uh, pops up in this until construction. The functional load is what makes it so attractive, because I have, yes, I have put these things. Mm. Where do I, do I say it as all? Yeah. Uh, so the, there is the attraction to mark the endpoint by a pre-post element. So it's very simple. You can say, okay, I just say mpaka, and then I can put the endpoint. Uh, I think that, that that thing is why it is so easily spread. But it is not the only uh, that can, cannot explain it all, because there are a number of languages that have a construction which in, with, with an until that is not from the Mpaka from Swahili, but then that replace uh, their original construction with Mpaka. Uh, I claim it can, uh, the explanation of parallel grammaticalization 
there's actually no, in, no evidence that points exclusively in that direction. There is a plenty of evidence that puts in the direction that it is borrowed and not uh, a grammatical experiment in a parallel way. There is the hatha, the other form in Swahili for until, is, is, is a similar thing. It is uh, borrowed from Arabic, where the form, where the grammaticalization must have happened in Arabic, where it went for the word for boundary to until. So it is conceivable that the people knew that grammaticalization copied it, yet for the, for the time concept that doesn't work because that would mean that I mean the, the Swahili people when they used Hatta would, would really know uh, Arabic quite well to understand that that, that grammaticalization was going on. I have to mention that option because the grammaticalization from boundary to until is rare, it's extremely rare. It is Arabic, it is Swahili and people have claimed Heine and Kuteva uh, more, but I think the more example is simply not valid. So, still, although it's rare, I don't think it, it, I don't understand why it is rare, because to me it seems a very logical thing to do. Uh, and so I take it as a coincidence that that is so rare, and not a historical fact uh, of uh, people knowing the thing of Arabic when they use Swahili. So far for uh, until. Any questions about until? Mpaka? Because there's a workshop. <laughs> yes. In Matengo, uh, the Matengo borrowed is Mpaka. Yeah. And the, the, I saw your chart yeah. and the the, the the boundary. It, it can mean boundary and also until. Yeah. But also the another grammaticalization, the kata plus uh, subjunctive, it means like near future. Kata ni ende means I will go soon. Kata to the kata to fike. Kata to fike means I will uh, arrive soon. We will, we will arrive soon. But does it, uh, did you find such? Uh, well, first the, the 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 one plus the clause, uh, which is then nearly always uh, uh, temporal rather than than of course than, than than locational, is I think the most often used the, the most common use for for the until certainly in Swahili when you look at the, at the Helsinki corpus then that is how paka is used most of the time. So the time is much more uh, dominant than, than play. So I'm not surprised that that can develop into, in, into yeah, more specialized temporal functions. But I haven't, I don't recall that I've seen other cases where it was a specific tense expression. Yeah. In Matengo, the, this, the most uh, biggest use of yeah. the is this uh, near future. Yeah, yeah. So construction-wise, that is that fits the the the, 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 the general picture. Yes. Can can you show the first slides of the Bushitic language? Yes. So it's interesting. The first two languages have a different word for boundary, mm -hmm. but the preposition uses place. But Sandawe has the same word for boundary. Yeah. And there the use is for time. I don't know I don't know the word for boundary. This this uh, is a question mark. Mark. Yes. And these empty boxes I would not pay I would not in put interpretation into that because yeah, you get an Oftentimes you don't get it at all in the grammars because uh, um, it, it is it's Swahili, yeah, so it should fit into. And then you find it in the text, and then I'm depending on the examples in the text that are there, and I think that is uh, showing much more the the limitation of the data that I used mm -hmm. than anything else. Uh, what is what is interesting is maybe Konso, which has uh, Hakka, which is not in direct uh, contact with Swahili, and uh, people have no 
they don't know at all. Nobody knows Swahili there, and uh, they must have had it through Bordana. The the curve between vowels is voiced in consonants, so that difference isn't there phonetically. Um, but you see, it goes even through other languages, and it shows the the eagerness to borrow. Baka. <laughs> <laughs> It is really uh, an epidemic. <laughs> yeah? That's another small question. I think there is, there is also Hadi in yeah. Sandab, of course, that's we. So there's three of them, yeah. like Hatta and Hadi. Yeah. I mean, that itself is also interesting because it seems like for language which doesn't prepositions in the standard, so we can get many. But it's a very rich formal inventory yeah. for that of the semantic space. And I, you know, I mean, I've never thought of it, but we're to see what the differences are, if there are any, in terms of, in terms of semantics. Because I, I think party is just a dialectal thing, maybe. Mm -hmm. you know, I've always thought party in a coastal form. I can make that, but maybe that is just a bunch of Yeah, I, I, I don't have a feeling about that. Uh, mm -hmm. I, so. But it's true, if you, if you look at those, those words that, that, that fit roughly into that category, uh, quite, uh, quite many of them are, are Arabic in origin. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's interesting for me, again, mm -hmm. just in addition, for me, Hadi was the word Tangu. Sorry, Hadi will? So, Hadi was the word Tangu. Oh, okay. But I'm not sure. I'm sure yeah, it yeah, can, yeah, yes. Yeah, I don't yeah, think there's a strict constraint on it. It would be harder to have a strict constraint on it. It would be harder to have a strict constraint on it. I don't think it's a hard grammatical term. Yeah. Okay. It's uh, something to, to look at. Um, the one other thing is that shocked me, actually, really shocked me, not so long, I mean a few years ago. Uh, it was, yeah, 2017, Anna a student of mine, she was working on Iraq, and she came with this uh, sentence, on and the sentence that I would have, uh, uh, I mean, maybe, 15 years earlier, <laughs> not that much. I, mean, <laughs> I can say that, not that much. It's Ankun Loach La Gera Makai Flem Roalea. And um, Anna was working on this one. So, why is ablative? So, it would be in front of all animals. I like you a lot. I like you more than. All the other animals, I like you most. And so the comparison is just given with the ablative. Uh, and um, this was now rejected. It was not just that another construction was used, but uh, her speaker and uh, Christina now, and it's Basilisa, says, no, that's not good. <laughs> We have to say tamakai flamero. The ta is a Iraqi uh, word, um, but what what surprised me is that in that short span of time, and this comes from a story. This was not from elicitation. It was a natural story. The the comparison, comparative construction, changed and becomes more similar to kuliko and yamawati to the Swahili. Uh, what do you think, Crispina? What would you say? Which one, which of the two? The first one sounds more than the second. Yeah? The first one. <laughs> the first one. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I can add another. Yeah? I can say, and then I yeah, commit yeah, 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 yeah. Ale because yeah. I exclude dir. 
I would say that's a variant of the of the first one. It is the yeah. The wa uh, it's indicating uh, with a different construction the set to which you want to do your comparison uh, with this wa and here with the ta. Okay. That's the only form that I get in Gorwa. I've never had gera. I've never had gera. Ah, you see? So I think still there is something going on that this construction is in the process of, of changing. And um, so this is, of course, a kind of language change that goes on <laughs> in all the languages of, of East Africa. With Swahili creeping into it, where you don't see it. This is all Iraqi material, but it is just eating from inside, and uh, yeah. A bit further back, no, I think I'll skip this. We'll have a talk on that. Uh, Orma influence on uh, Ilwana. Um, so Arma is Cushitic language, Ilwana is a Bantu language, and this is Kenya, uh, coastal area. Uh, we're familiar with this problem in many Bantu languages. I mean, class 9 and 10, they have the same form. And so we don't know whether we're talking about singular or plural, unless we, we have some uh, modifiers. Uh, but what they do in Ilwana, they distinguish them by using a suffix. Uh, Cushitic suffix ena to distinguish them. That is what the literature will say, except that they don't say from which Cushitic language, and some of them they realize that there is no current present day Cushitic language that you can show that it is from, but I mean, it's not Bantu. Uh, <laughs> this is a, a, a recurrent problem in working on language contact, uh, Bantu Cushitic uh, through, uh, I mean, up to, up to recently, many people have said, oh, uh, non bantu uh, And I think I, I, I want to say, well, uh, yes, maybe, I mean, even if we can't look to uh, show a Cushitic language nowadays, it is the E occurs quite often, the long E in, in, in plural suffixes in many Cushitic languages. But at least let's keep the mind open because also in Maasai and in Neglotic you also get the suffixes with the wrong name. Uh, the keep this in is just a small remark, but it plays a role in Maambuki Mbugu. Change undone. Um, there are several cases where uh, the, the change has happened and you can't see it anymore. And it's only, I mean, sometimes that we can actually uh, see that, that the change has happened and then has been undone. Because most of the time, of course, we will not notice that at all. It is just a reminder that we have to keep that in our mind when we talk to uh, other disciplines that you say, okay, I mean, we don't see all the language contact that might have been. The very uh, um, common one that, uh, that is reported all over the world is that in situations where people tend to learn the dominant language better, they will readapt the earlier loans to the correct pronunciation now that they've mastered the correct pronunciation. So the word chupa is now chupa, whereas in Iraqu word uh, used to be Tupa. Ah, this is, I don't have much data on this, but it's a, a nice story and not everybody knows about it. This, the, 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 the Somali Bantu, the, as they are called in, in, in the United States. Or the, the Mushungule, the Wazigua, who were captured as slaves brought to Somalia 
work there in banana plantations were sort of no longer slaves but still in a dependent position, uh, looked down upon by the Somali, kept their language, heavily Somaliized, uh, Somali influence over that same 150 years. Uh, then with the, the civil war in Somalia uh, with everybody else, they fled now being dependent on aid organizations, they were equal. I mean, the aid organizations are not going to say, you're a real Somali, you're just dirt, no. So that brought to them a completely different perspective. Uh, also realizing their origin, so many of them who were in the refugee camps in, in uh, near Mombasa, they, they were then later brought to the refugee camp in Handeni, very close to the current Sikua area. I was in Handeni and, try, and, and spoke to some of those uh, um, people and um, they have quickly readapted their speech to how Zikua is nowadays and probably also was some time ago. So there, were, there had been some phonological adaptations to the Somali, and that's described for the uh, Mushumbuli in Somalia. So the, the pa is now, uh, it's no longer the uvular uh, sound. So they, in just a very quick period, they, they redid their adaptations to Somali and went back to the Sikua. This is a sign. There's something wrong with the battery. So that was just an aside also that uh, I don't think that those kind of situations happen very often, but that there is the capacity to, to you know, just to undo all those uh, changes that, uh, that happened. Um, do we, I think the next slides are my Maha story, but I guess most people know, well, Maya <laughs> can talk about it in a much better position, just finished well, not just, it's uh, more than a year ago, now that you finished your thesis, when? two years ago, three. 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 That's <laughs> when you get old, huh? Time flies. No, it's right. It's nearly, it's, it's just waiting. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about Ma and Bubu uh, because of the Taita connection. Hmm. So, and, and that is, uh, his fault. Yeah, he, he wanted me to, to contribute to uh, what is the yet another handbook. book. And I said, no, I have written enough about the book. And he says, yes, let's write something new. <laughs> so I had to do something new. And uh, one of the new things in there is the going deeper into the origin of the the non-Bantu vocabulary in the mixed language variety. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, they, I've, I've really examined some of these sources, but I've also had a, a, a more closer look at the Taita connection. Taita means the Taita hills in Kenya. These are from the, the area where this mixed language is spoken. Usambara Mountains, it's just across the border, it's not very far. There's now a national park, so it, the, the connection is no longer there. But in the not too distant past, there must have been a lot of connection. There's, there's spoken on hills, um, and those, uh, the Bantu languages, Davida, Zagala, they, they have quite some non-Bantu words in it. Um, there's an article by Eret uh, and Nurse, and on the basis of the loan words, they they argue that there are two, that must have been two different Cushitic languages there. 
um, that fits very well with the archaeological evidence so well that you wonder maybe that's how they know that there must be two <laughs> because linguistically <laughs> it's not that easy <laughs> to, to tear them apart um, and then the third influence in their article is from the mixed language in, in, the, in, the, in those Bantu languages um, they don't discuss that and question it so for them for that third influence it is from the mixed language borrowed into, transferred into both Davida and Sagala. Um, for me, with uh, my story of how the mixed language arose, uh, I have to re-examine that and see, well, what can this uh, connection with data tell us about the history? And that, and that is confusing and that is very difficult. I don't, I don't, um, the, the two things going on, probably, and, and one complicating factor is, is uh, that there is a Sagala community and has been, and has been for at least 100 years in the Usambara Mountains, still speaking Sagala. So I don't know whether they are influential enough to, to bring words into the, the mixed language, but the pos possibility is there. Possibility is there that it is something recent. The other possibility that I have to consider is that the long ago original Hushidic language that these people must have spoken, I don't know when, but long time ago, that that was actually the predecessor of those languages in the Taita Hills. Taita Hills are uh, fit geographically in that when I, when I try to pinpoint the, the oldest Cushitic source, there are some indications that that might be close to Dahalo. And then Taita is roughly the area, but closer to, to where the, the Mbuku are. Okay. I have to go back. So the oral history is that for these mixed languages, we came from Lukipia, mid mythical place far away. We were in the Pare Mountains. That is shifted to Pare. Uh, they, they, uh, they, they then, the oral history says, in Vude, we, uh, we went to Mbugwe area, or before we went to Vude, and then we, we became servants, the Robo, among the Maasai. And then, uh, because the Maasai had stolen our cattle, we we captured our cattle, we had to flee, Maasai are stronger, we went into the Usambara Mountains. But if you look to the, the more clan histories, there are two routes into the Usambara Mountains that weakly coincide with their repertoire. Uh, the mixed language, oh, okay, I can show how mixed it is by, yeah, by using this text, but also by the elicitation. Elicitation, something goes wrong with the font. That is my stupidity. Oh no, that, 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 uh, the yen sign, you can just forget it, doesn't matter. <laughs> There's no money involved. <laughs> <laughs> the very contextually appropriate one. <laughs> the, uh, Mm, this is how, when, when I noticed that, that this is actually the same thing, I mean, it had been reported that, these, that there is this mixed language, and oh yes, there's also Bantu language spoken in the area, and never the two were uh, linked to each other, and then I did my elicitation, I went to another village where people told me they speak that Bantu language, so, and they said, well, if you want to, say yes, please, do these same sentences in your Bantu language, and, and then you get this line, and uh, in the other villages I first had this one before the translation of Sikulima Shambhalamu Makajana, and this is just the same with all of them. You get exactly the same sentence, except that all the, all the lexical items are replaced. Well, not for the Muva in this example, but in principle they're all and then the whole medical structure is the same. That was my aha erlebnis. Hey, this is, this is the same thing. 
in there. And then, uh, what is it? It is one grammar with two parallel lexicons, and the lexicons are really parallel in grammatical ex in information, in semantics, in all of it. But the mixed language has then roots from a different source, non-Bantu. And here the non-Bantu uh, is, is a valid uh, uh, category because, well, quite a few are from Maasai. Uh, and then there are two Cushitic sources, and there is this Taita, which I want to, uh, I'm looking into now. There's also uh, from the normal uh, Bantu language, there's also a source, and that is because of the manipulation that uh, um, some of the normal words are made into uh, good enough to be uh, in, in, in a mixed variety, truncation and final uh, vowel. E, and the change to the gl. So this is what I mean with this manipulation. Uh, this is the normal bantu and bubu and then low high tone pattern and change the vowel fast the final vowel to e remember that e no suffix so if you imagine that plus the truncation that is also what you would get i think this is the origin of the the high tone e is the uh, suffix with a long vowel e that has been added to a lot of words and this is the introducing introduction of the lateral fricative. So L or S in some words are just changed to gl. Nice sound, gl. Easy. Gl. Isn't it easy? But very weird. I mean, if you're in Bantu speaker and then they say, ah, these people, they do gl, gl, gl. It's, uh, yeah, it sticks out. It serves the purpose. So the, uh, the scenario, because it's history, you, in, the, in the beginning I, I resisted to that, but Thomason forced me to say, you have to come with a story. So this is a story. Uh, they once spoke Eastern Cushitic language, maybe in Kenya, uh, like Kipia, Lukipia, or maybe in the Taita Hills. They moved to the Pare Mountains, they switched to Pare Bantu, they had the beginning of a parallel lexicon because that's what you have when you lose a language and the language that you used to use becomes a sort of parallel lexicon in the language that is dominant. Uh, and then they were able to expand that lexicon because they were in contact with a lot of non-Bantu languages and then they moved into the Usambaras. But then this Taita, I, I think I've said most of this. Uh, yeah, so these, these are my, uh, where I go in both directions. So um, those words from the Taita languages, um, some, the very few, but some of them end up in the normal Google register, and, um, th which is normal Google is 99% is simply pare, normal pare. So, sorry, sorry, um, and and most of it they, they are taken up in the as the in the deviant lexicon of the mixed language. Um, but I have used I haven't explained this. I've used again that project in Leipzig, where they looked at borrowing in a number of languages the same word list. When you do that. And one thing they did is to establish the borrowability of concepts. Okay, uh, we use basic vocabulary list, we use Swadesh, with the assumption that those words are, are yeah, resistant to borrowing, but it's not empirically shown. And they are sort of able to show empirically which words are, are stable and which words are not. And more, moreover, they, they give a list of 100. It's a pity that they give 100 because with the method that they have, they could do that for the 1,500 words that they have. And they also put an um, uh, index to it in how often it is borrowed. So it is not 
a simple list of 100, but it's a, yeah, the, the least borrowed word to the, that goes on. So in that top 100, uh, many of the words that I have from the other Cushitic sources, uh, they are in that top 100. Uh, and because if you want to, to create a new language, you, you will use the words that you use all the time. So it, it is very normal to borrow, it's not really borrowing, but to take words from the most common concepts if, if you have to speak about everything in, in a language for which you don't want to use the words that you actually already know. <coughs> but the ones from Taita are not, uh, not in the top. So they're the kind of words that you don't, uh, uh, in, in general, that, you, that, you, that are not that resistant to borrowing. That may be, that indicates that it might be a bit later the Taita influence because you already had the other ones. Um, none of them show any of these endings, also not the e, uh, none of them show the archaic cause of the T. I haven't talked about that. But, but these observations, they, they point to Taita being relatively late and, pr and oh, is that still readable? Well, we have the, the lateral fricative is there in the Taita Bantu languages. I mean, it's very rare in East African Bantu, the uh, lateral uh, fricative, but you have the, the Af probably the African any fricative in that Taita Bantu. Presumably, yeah, Cushitic influence. Um, the and that, as I just showed you, that that flirt is then also used in the manipulation, and that is independent of Taita. But if if that idea of using the flirt as an indication of Cushiticness, then and that is present in Taita, then that Taita points to an early link to the mixed language. So that is my uh, problem here. This, uh, <coughs> we need more data. I need more data on the, on the Taita in order to, to get a better understanding of, of what the transfer really was. But it's probably too late. Uh, I mean, the, those words are probably gone. I don't know. Well, I, I will have to go. I'll have to go. Of somebody else, <laughs> somebody else volunteering to go. That would be nice. There's something that I skipped. Uh, I am also don't have time. I want to say something about shift with no trace. Uh, I've said it before, but I want to say it again. Most of language shift leaves no trace. Let me not. Let us not forget that. I mean. Uh, in Iraqu, most of the clans are from, from outside of Iraqu area, but you can't hear that in Iraqu. You don't see the, the influence of, uh, of these other languages in Iraqu. Most shift is without any trace. I wanted to say something about the Asakh. Yeah, maybe I should go here. Um, Asa, uh, so that is one of those, was, yeah, still is one of those, the robo groups in the Maasai Plains. Um, um, I have been looking for them for some time and when I really actually found enough to sit down and get whatever they still know about Asa out of them, uh, I got a lot of uh, lexicon, remarkably, Many words still remembered, but I got a number of speakers and I asked a number of times and I got an enormous amount of variation. This is different from the other sources that we have on Quadza, on Sanye, on any of these other Dorobo groups. We have sources from one moment of elicitation with one person. Uh, and we take this now as the word for Quadza. Uh, but 
if that is in, recorded in the same kind of level of language attrition, we have to be careful. That is what I want to say. Because this is what I get. I get this kind of lipa, limpa, lipa, the same form for the same, the, the, the different forms of the same word. Linta, lika, sagala, segala, sengala. A lot of different forms. Uh, um, of course, sometimes a completely different root, but what is uh, worrying most to me is that the same root can have all sorts of different forms, depending on which day, which person you ask. And in meaning, uh, we can say a little bit more than this because we, for some we know the, the roots and we can say, well, it must have meant uh, something like uh, eating, but okay, now we have meat, goat, wild animal, cow, domok, giraffe, leopard, alan, eland. These are hunters. They do know the difference <laughs> between these animals, <laughs> but it's just that the words that they don't know anymore. They, they have one very nice thing, is that they, for all the wild animals, they, apart from the words, they also have the reporting a hit. What do you mean with that? If they shoot an animal, and then they have a, a word which, which can be do, done on a high pitch and with elongated length to indicate, we have shot a female giraffe. And this is apparently uh, something that is common among hunter-gatherers, uh, hunters, hunters, lexicon, and that is still there. They also, the the woman in in my group uh, still knows those reporting hits. This is the same person, at different times. So this is the message. You get a lot of variation and. Uh, there must have been a lot of uh, variation uh, also in the situations where these other people got, got information from the languages that are dead or about to die. Um, uh, of course, we want to know more about what happens in language attrition if we want to understand the e early history of East Africa. Um, so in the, the Asa case, and most of them, it was attrition of a second language, I mean, because they had already taken Maasai as, as the most important language, so that second language just got lost. Most studies on language attrition are about uh, languages that you learn in the formal context, and these were languages that you just heard from your parents and, and learned that way. So we need to know more about what kind of words are, are uh, retained in, this, in the situation of language shift. Uh, I think I've put my conclusions right in the beginning. So I think I'll start, stop here. I've used more than an hour. Thank you.